1916 was a massively important year in the history of armor development, for both France and the world at large. It was during this year that Britain's Mark I tanks were first engaged in combat, and that two French tank designs, the saint chamond and the Schneider CA-1, were first ordered for mass production. In the history of France's armor development in particular, 1916 was also marked by the start of one of the most ambitious tank projects of the war, which would result in a wildly innovative design, the FCM-1A. Welcome to a new Tank Encyclopedia voiced article. I'm your host Stan, and if you like the kind of work we do here, why not join us? We're looking for writers, proofreaders, illustrators, video and audio editors, pretty much anything you can find if you're interested in tanks and want to help. For more details, join our Discord, there's a link in the description. The First World War had, during the mere months after it broke out, turned from a mobile war of maneuver to a vastly more static war of position, prompted by the considerable evolutions of the late 19th and early 20th centuries in artillery and small arms technology, which were not matched by advancements in transport and motorization. With both sides finding it impossible to achieve large breakthroughs, and France seeing some of the industrial parts of its territory occupied by the Kaiser's troops, there were massive incentives to find a solution to the problem caused by trench warfare. The idea of all-terrain armored vehicles is one which quickly appeared in the minds of engineers in both France and Great Britain. The first years of these armor developments, 1915 and 1916, were, in France, marked by a variety of vastly different proposals being put forward. However, this was largely without a formal structure being in place to evaluate them properly. Engineers and representatives would often collaborate to try to push their design to the forefront, as various figures tried to gain a hold on the procurement of armored vehicles by negotiating with the Undersecretary of Armament, Albert Thomas. The most famous of those figures is, undoubtedly, Colonel Jean Estienne. Colonel Estienne had gained some considerable control upon the procurement of France's armored vehicles, most notably after he was named Director of the Special Artillery, France's tank force in World War I in September of 1916. Nonetheless, while Estienne would be extremely influential late in the war, in 1916 his control was still very incomplete. A good example of this chaotic procurement process in 1916 was the procurement of the Schneider CA-1 and saint chamond tanks. Both were vehicles which shared a number of characteristics such as a casemate-mounted 75mm gun and a short suspension that left much of the hull's front forward, which proved detrimental to trench crossing. Both of those vehicles were designed in ignorance of the other, with no coordination over their performance or protection. Nonetheless, 400 of both vehicles were ordered within a short time of each other in 1916. While Estienne had been a major proponent of the CA-1, he would only learn of the existence of the saint chamond tank around the time the order for it was finalized. The major proponent of the saint chamond had been another military figure who played a key role in the birth of France's tank force, General Léon Augustin Mouret, who was the leader of the French Army's automotive service. General Mouret was a rival to Estienne, particularly in 1916, and Mouret was also to be at the origin of FCM's heavy tank projects. General Mouret appeared to have been imagining the concept of a heavy tank for some time in the summer of 1916. In September, he took part in a bilateral meeting between the French and the British, which was held to reach the conclusions of the first operational use of British tanks at the Somme. Among the participants of this meeting was Lieutenant Colonel Albert Stern, leader of the Tank Supply Committee and previously part of the Landship Committee, and a key figure in Britain's tank development during the war. Mouret traded views with Stern and was introduced in more extensive detail to the British Mark I tank design. When comparing it to the French vehicles in development at that time, Mouret found the Mark I to be substantially more advanced. 
Murray notably lauded that the naval engineers had had a major role in the vehicle's development and judged that they had done a superior job to the French saint chamond and Schneider CA, which were mostly the result of artillery manufacturers. Notably, he found that the naval engineers had thought of vastly superior fire protection, air circulation and habitability arrangements than Schneider and saint chamond He also found that the British design's heavier weight was necessary to allow a better blend of protection, firepower and mobility. In October of 1916, General Mouret, supported by the Under Secretary of State for Inventions Regarding Defense, Jules Louis Breton, managed to lobby the Under Secretary for Artillery and Military Equipment, Albert Thomas, to order a heavy tank prototype from a naval shipyard. Clearly, the goal was to emulate the British method and to try to develop a vehicle superior to the CA-1 and saint chamond Thus, on the 20th of October 1916, an order for a prototype vehicle was placed with Forge et Chantier de la Méditerranée, or FCM. FCM was a naval shipyard with its main facilities at Le Senso Mer, on the Mediterranean coast. The company enjoyed a stellar reputation in the 1900s and 1910s, being a major producer of civilian ships and warships alike. Upon receiving the order, FCM's administrator, Frederick Moritz, gave the task of designing and producing the vehicle to the company's shipyard at Le Senso Mer. The shipyard's director, Leon Rimbaud, recruited the engineers Lucien Savatier and A. Jamy to lead the project. They quickly got to work and, by January 1917, had already produced a design of which they had made a large wooden mock-up. In the meantime, at the request of Undersecretary Jules-Louis Breton, Undersecretary Albert Thomas created the CCAS, the Advisory Committee of Special Artillery. Officially brought into existence on the 13th of December 1916, this committee grouped representatives of various ministries, the French Army High Command, industrialists and deputies who had been involved in armored vehicle design. This last category included Colonel Estienne and some in the committee who shared his views. This FCM project, designed by FCM with help from Renault, was the subject of the very first discussions within the CCAS on the 17th of December 1916. The second CCAS meeting, held on the 30th of December, had as main topic Renault's light tank project. At that second meeting, the FCM design was also discussed, which by that point had become a fairly well-established concept of a 38-ton tank armed with a 105mm howitzer, protected by 30mm of armor and powered by a 200 horsepower engine. This set of characteristics was presented by FCM's administrator, Frederick Moritz. The project's development was therefore going in a direction quite opposite to what Estienne desired. Colonel Estienne, known in France as the father of the tank, wanted the special artillery to focus on a very light and also a very heavy design. The FCM project was simply not being made large enough to fulfill this second category. He also preferred the idea of a higher velocity 75mm gun as the main armament of the heavy tank, opposed to the low velocity 105mm howitzer planned. The third meeting of the CCAS on the 17th of January 1917 was dedicated almost entirely to the FCM project. Under Secretary Jules-Louis Breton had, days prior, on the 13th, visited FCM's facilities at La Senso Mer, and had been presented with the already solid design in the form of the complete two-scale mock-up which made a massive impression on Breton. While Estienne was not present in this meeting, he too had been presented this project and found it to be well presented and satisfactory, despite it not being the very heavy design he had wanted. Estienne noted his preference for a 75mm gun over the 105mm howitzer, and was overall satisfied enough that he requested the CCAS to approve the production of two prototypes, one with an electric and one with a mechanical transmission though in the end the prototypes ordered would not be the same as what Estienne requested. Breton, on the other hand, 
wanted an order for 50 vehicles to be passed immediately, but he saw this being rejected by the CCAS. The majority vote by CCAS was to focus on material already in production and view the doctrine of heavy tank use as still being too ill-defined to warrant a production run. While this meeting was viewed as disappointing by proponents of the FCM design, including Breton, on the 5th of February 1917, the Ministry of Armament ordered two additional prototypes from FCM, in addition to the first ordered in October 1916. While the first prototype would have a mechanical transmission, the two newly ordered vehicles would feature oil electric and oil hydraulic transmission designs. These two later prototypes would not actually end up being produced. By early 1917, the first prototype was due to be completed and begin its trials in May. While development and production of the tank itself was done by FCM, the gearbox and engines were a product of Renault. The whole of 1917 was marked by tremendous delays from Renault, which meant that without its engine or gearbox, the prototype's trials could not begin. The exact reason for those delays is not quite known, though Renault being overtasked and already vastly engaged in the FT Light tank notably have been raised as potential explanations. In any case, by June, FCM was still awaiting Renault's part of the deal. By August, when asking the firm about the whereabouts of those elements, Breton received an answer saying that the engine and gearbox would not be delivered for at least three weeks. Finally, on the 18th of October 1917, Morris was able to place a date, around the 20th of November, for the FCM 1A's trials to begin. In practice, they would begin a month later on the 20th of December 1917, with the presence of the CCAS as well as a number of other officers, including an American and a British representative. The whole design for FCM's heavy tank was rectangular, narrow, and elongated. The vehicle had an impressive length of 8.35 meters, but at 2.84 meters wide, including the suspension, was only slightly larger than the much lighter saint chamond The hull was also quite tall, standing at 1.98 meters and had a ground clearance of 40 centimeters. To its front, it featured a single Hotchkiss Model 1914 8mm machine gun firing through a ball mount on the lower glacis. Two crewmen, the driver and a machine gunner, stood at the hull's front, each having an openable vision port. Three crewmen stood further back in the hull, with two located behind the turret ring being tasked with handing the 105mm shells from the hull racks to the turret. The third man was a mechanic, tasked with operating and maintaining the engine and transmission. The hull, without the suspension, engine and radiator, had the weight of 17,500 kilograms. Those elements had a weight of 19,300 kilograms. A total of 122 105mm rounds were carried within the hull, 18 in front of the turret ring, 8 to each side of it, and 44 on each side of the hull behind the turret. The suspension of the FCM 1A featured a series of four wheel bogies, some placed on the inside and some on the outside of the track. Six small return rollers were present on the top of the suspension, and it appears to have had a front drive sprocket and a rear idler. This layout may seem basic by modern standards, but a major innovation for French armor design was that the suspension was as long as the hull itself. On the CA-1 and particularly the saint chamond the hull stuck out in front and behind the suspension, making the vehicle's movement on irregular terrain systematic in trench warfare, very hazardous. With its extremely long hull and equally long suspension, the FCM-1A was not at such a risk of becoming embedded in a bank or trench as it crossed this difficult terrain. Also helping the tank over rough and often saturated ground were the 60 cm wide tracks, which gave the vehicle ground pressure of just 0.6 kg per cm square. A particularly impressive feature of the FCM-1A was its armor layout. 
The vehicle offered 35mm of armor to the front, 21mm to the side and rear, and 15mm on the top and bottom, on both the hull and the turret. While this may not seem particularly impressive by World War II standards, it was exceptional by the standards of World War I. For example, the 15mm of belly or roof armor was heavier than the primary armor on the CA-1, which had a maximum of 11.5mm of armor, or the Saint-Chamond with just 17mm. Even in comparison to the British-American Mark 8 International Liberty heavy tank, this was heavy armor, as that vehicle did not feature more than 16mm of armor. Only the German Sturmpanzerwagen A7V could somewhat compete with the FCM-1A's frontal 35mm of armor with its 30mm, but the German design was inadequate cross-country and was totally outclassed by FCM's heavy tank. The engine used on the FCM-1A was a 12-cylinder Renault petrol engine, producing 220 horsepower at 1,200 rpm. This engine provided the FCM-1A with a respectable power-to-weight ratio of 5.3 horsepower per ton. This was higher than the CA-1 at 4.4, the Saint-Chamond at 3.9, the British Mark IV male at 3.75, and the British Mark V at 5.2. Of vehicles which had at least reached prototype stage by 1917, only the British medium Mark A Whippet outdid the FCM's horsepower per ton at 6.4. The FCM 1A's engine compartment also had quite considerable additional space available to allow a larger and more powerful engine in the future, and the proposed evolution of the design the 45-ton FCM-1B, which was to mount a 380 horsepower engine. Exhaust for the engine was featured on the top of the hull behind the turret. The radiator was to the rear of the hull. The FCM-1A featured what appears to be a fully rotating turret. Whilst this vehicle by no means invented the concept, this was still a fairly uncommon feature for World War I tanks, particularly on vehicles of this size. The FCM-1A's turret was mostly rounded in shape, housing two crew members. To the left sat a commander-slash-gunner, and to the right a loader which would also serve as machine gunner. The vehicle had a large, initially square command cupola that stuck out on the left side, from which the commander could observe the battlefield. The main gun featured in this turret was a Schneider 105mm short howitzer. This gun was purposely designed for the FCM-1A and may have been loosely based on Schneider's Model 1913 105mm field gun, albeit substantially shortened. The very short barrel of the gun only gave it a muzzle velocity of 240 meters per second. However, the shells fired from the FCM-1A's gun had a massive 4 kilograms of explosive charge heavier than the entire shells fired by most other tanks of the war, which generally had 57mm guns like the British and Germans. By way of comparison, the explosive shells fired by the French Army's standard 75mm field gun, the model 1897, featured on the late model of the Saint-Chemin tank, contained just 0.695kg of explosive. While the rate of fire of the FCM-1A's 105mm gun would have been very low, its destructive potential against trench systems and fortifications was great. 